This morning, we're going to talk the way, of, the way of faith, the way of faith. I want to read a bizarre story to you this morning. Um, and especially if you've never been in church in your life, we're going to read this story and you're going to be like, this is why I don't go to church. But do not check out. I want to read a bizarre, a bizarre story to you this morning. But there is one sentence in there that I would like to, to draw out this morning. Mark chapter 9. If you have a Bible, you want to turn there. There's a Bible in your pee back. If you don't have one, that's yours. Uh, I know you got you on your phone, your Android, your Apple phone, your flip Samsung phone, whatever you got, your razor. My first phone was my sister's pink razor. That was my first phone. My junior year of high school, razor. Whop! They were so loud when you flipped them too, right? It was like, whop! When you're like, everybody knows you opened your phone. Like, that's how loud they are when you'd flip those razors. Some of you are like, what's a razor? You were so young, I hate you. Um, Mark chapter 9. Really, really weird story with an interaction with Jesus, this father, his disciples, and this father's son. It says this, when they return, now return, if you go early to Mark 9 or Mark chapter 8, what just happened was the Mount of Transfiguration. If you know what that means, it's this really wild story where Jesus, Peter, James, and John go to the mountain and like God opens the sky and talks to his son. And the Bible says like he transfigured like white as snow and and. Um, his face was glowing and this whole mountain of transfiguration just happened in Mark 8. They're coming down from the mountain and this is what they mean when they return. That's what just happened. It says, when they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them and some of the teachers of the religious law were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe and they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing, Jesus asked. One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. Notice, I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever this spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. He foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and he becomes rigid. Now, stay with me. Wild story, okay? So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. So Jesus said to them, you faithless people. It's interesting that you could be a follower of Jesus and still be faithless. He says, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. When the evil spirit saw Jesus, which is a really interesting sentence we won't get into this morning, it threw the child into a violent convulsion and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father, and he replied, since he was a little boy. The spirit often throws into the fire and the water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. Help us if you can. What do you mean, if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes or if a person has faith. I love verse 24. This is all I want to read. And the father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. He said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Go back to verse 24. I want to unpack that one sentence this morning. He instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me in my unbelief. I do believe, but help me in my unbelief. This morning, I want to unpack this wildly bizarre story about this father and his son and the father's response to Jesus. Let's look at the way of faith this morning. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this really, really bizarre story, Jesus, and a little bit hard to understand and hard to understand what you're doing, but Father, I pray that you would speak to us this morning, God, whether this is our first time ever in church, ever, Jesus, and this is a bit overwhelming, but uncomfortable, God, whether we come every single week, and God, maybe we've had a rough week, and we're just here crawling in, Jesus, just trying to get ready for this next week, Father, I pray for any head that is down, would you lift it this morning, God, any heavy heart, would you give a weightlessness to us this morning, God, any, any just, um, situation, God, we bring it to you this morning. Father, we be here. Would you speak to us in your word? Reveal yourself to us this morning, Jesus, in your mighty, mighty name I pray. And everyone said? 
Um, faith is an interesting subject, and I think for many of us, when the word faith gets brought up, unfortunately, we think of a lot of stories and situations like TBN. Now, if you don't know what TBN is, thank God, okay? So don't feel left out this morning. You should be thankful you don't know what TBN is. Um, but there, there's a lot of church, if you could call it that, television shows. It's always some guy with a fake wig um, asking for your money. And it always goes something like, if you sow $1,000, the Lord will erase all of your debt. Um, and people do it. Um, which is amazing, you know. Um, no, no lie, one time I saw this guy on TBN and he was selling actual wood pieces from Jesus' cross. <laughs> if you sow $1,000, I will send you a splinter of the very cross of Jesus Christ. And people were buying wood from Home Depot from this guy <laughs> for a $1,000 seed of investment. And they believe they got a piece of the cross of Jesus. And unfortunately, we have now equated that to what faith is. And you see some crazy thing on your grandma's TV or someone brought to a church as a kid and someone does something so elaborately unbiblical and that's what we've now attached faith to. So what is faith? Is it the whole blab it, grab it, I said it so God has to do it? Is it I believed it? I, this word is starting to rub me the wrong way, people. Manifest. Listen, if you're one of those manifest people, I'm going to find you after service and we're going to talk. Um, this whole, like, how did you get the raise? I manifested it. I'm like, no, you didn't manifest anything. You're manifesting weirdness is what you're manifesting. Um, they're probably homeschooled. But that's beside the point. Um, like, we, we now equate it to, like, faith is, like, I manifested it. I said it. I spoke it, right? The whole, I, I said it out loud. Now, God has a, a tie to my words, and I had faith. And when did that become faith? So this morning, I would like to wrestle with the assignment on what is, what is faith? What is faith in a biblical sense? And for you and I, what does it mean to be people of faith? To be people of faith. Look at Hebrews 11.1. 1. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us what faith is. I want to unpack this for a little bit. Look at Now faith is. Now here we go. He's giving us what faith is. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the assurance. It's the confidence. It's the belief in the things that we hope for. It's the conviction of things unseen. It's the assurance of something hoped for. It's the confidence of something hoped for, but it is the conviction of something that we do not see. Hebrews eleven six, a few verses later, it's not on the screen, but then it goes on to say, for it is impossible to please God without faith. Interesting, it does not say it's impossible to please him without purity. It's impossible to please him without tithing. It's impossible to please him without perfect church attendance. He goes, no, it's impossible to please him without faith. Well, then if that's true, and I believe it is, then we must understand what faith is because it's apparently pretty important. If that's how we please God is with our faith. I want to write an Andrew definition for you from Hebrews 11 on what faith is. Okay? This is, I want you to write down. Faith is... Look at that definition up there. Nope, nope, not that. Nope. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Thank you, sir. Faith is the conviction that God doesn't lie. It is the expectation God will do what he said. What is faith? Faith is a conviction that God doesn't lie. It is the expectation he will do what he said. Now, I want to do something this morning. I've thought back and forth if I should do this or not. We're going to do it. Anyone in the room, I don't want you to put you on the spot. It's going to be fun. 
It's your first time ever at our church. This is your first time ever being here. You're a guest this morning, first time visitor. Can you put your hand up? Like, this is my first time ever in this church, ever, <laughs> ever. Okay. Can, can you, would you mind coming on stage with me? I'm not gonna have you do anything. Don't worry. Will you come on stage with me? Yeah, come on. Do you mind? Awesome. Come on, man. What's your name? Ben. Ben? Andrew, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. Are you single? Uh, no. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> good. Sounds good. Ben, we have never met. This is not some, like, earpiece. Find the guy Ben in the crowd, okay? Like, I have never met you. First time being here. You have no idea who I am. No, no, don't worry about it. <laughs> Nothing bad's going to happen. Just give me your money. Uh, come on. Um, we've never met. Do you trust me? No. no. <laughs> Why would you? Okay, I want, to, I want you to do something. Come stand right here. Close your eyes. And we're going to spin around a bit. Come on, spin around. Keep going, Ben. Come on, Ben! Your girlfriend's watching. Okay, stop. Stop. Close your eyes. Don't move. Okay? You don't know me. We've never met before in our entire lives. You said verbally you don't trust me. Why would you? You've never met me before. I would like you to, you ever done the trust fall before? Anybody ever dropped you before? <laughs> Great. We will name those friends later. Okay? As you came up, obviously there's nothing here for you to fall on. I'm just going to tell you that I'm going to catch you. Even though my voice is in front of you, I'm going to catch you. Okay? I want you to take one small step back. No, backward. There you go. There, yep, yep, yep. I want you to slowly sit down, and I'm going to catch you. So, yeah, do you trust me? <laughs> I'm not going to drop you, I promise. You want me to fall I, I want you to, like, fall backward as if you were going to sit on something. But when you came up here, you know there was nothing there because you saw nothing on the stage. I just want you to trust my word that I'm a trustworthy person. Okay? So I want you to slowly sit down. Okay. Okay. Stand up. Sit down. Stand up. Sit down. Now open your eyes. Now listen. You did not see what I saw. You had faith in that I'm not going to lie to you. Because I saw something you did not see. And the more times I told you to stand up and sit down, you sat down a lot more confidently. Every time, you sat down a lot more confidently than the first time. Why? Because I earned your trust of something I said was there that you did not know. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Faith is the conviction God will not lie. It is the assurance, it is the expectation he will do what he said. And the more times like Ben you learn he said, and I did it, and he didn't lie. The next time he tells me to do something, I'm going to do it with more confidence because he didn't lie the last time. And he starts building your what? Faith. Faith. Um, I wonder how many times you did not act in faith because you have not as settled in your heart yet God doesn't lie. Well, I didn't do it. Why? Because ultimately, deep down, you don't know if God is trustworthy yet. You don't know what, if he deserves your faith. But the more that you understand, he sees something you don't see. I knew the chair was there. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Ben hoped there was a chair there. Could you imagine if I just did this all as a scam to just have him fall? Ha <laughs> ha, Ben, thanks for coming. You know, like, Ben had an assurance. I hope there's a chair there. When he sat down, he had the conviction of things unseen. 
Ben did not look around and go, oh, chair. He sat down in the assurance of a hope. Once he sat in that hope, the conviction of the things unseen to him built his faith. This is what the journey of faith is, is sitting down blindly when God says, I see something you don't see. This is the journey of faith. And the more that you do it, the more that you go, I, I trust him. Why? It's the conviction of things hoped for. It's the assurance of things, what? Unseen. I want to give you seven one-line statements this morning. Most points I've ever had in my life. <laughs> about what faith is. I thought about doing this morning is something about what faith is not, but who cares what faith is not? Let's just talk about what faith is, because what faith is automatically says what faith is not. So let's just deal with what faith is this morning. Because here's, here's the thing. I want you, as we, as we embark on this journey this morning, because I'm going to build your faith this morning. God will never give you a life where he's not needed. God will never give you a life where he's not needed every day. So I would ask you this morning, if you are on this journey with God but do not need him, are you on a journey with yourself? Because there is no life in the life of a believer where you do not need him more today than you did yesterday. And every morning, it's, God, you better do something today. I don't know what I'm going to do. I need you. Why? Because God will never give you a life. When you say to yourself, I don't really need God to show up. Is there anything you are going through believing for or walking in right now where you don't need God to do anything? Because you can do it yourself. I would submit to you, you're not walking the life of faith. You're just on a walk. Because God will never, ever ask you to do something where you do not need him. Why? Because we are people of faith. Our entire history as a family that goes back a few years, thousands of years, we are people of faith. We believe that we can walk around a mountain and it will fall. We believe when God wor God's word is spoken, seas are split. We believe that things can fall from the sky and he can feed us in the wilderness. We believe out of obedience, we will not lack, we'll have water and food and protection. We believe that by a word, like we are people by definition of faith. Have you ever like asked your friend, are, are you a believer? Many of us, we call ourselves believer, but we rarely believe. It's in our title. Believer. People of faith. Families of faith. Churches of faith. And where God is taking our church, we're going to need him. Where God is taking you, you're going to need him. Where God is taking your marriage, you're going to need him. Where God is taking you after college, you're going to need him. And if you ever find yourself on a journey asking yourself, I don't really need God right now, you might have left him. And started on a journey where you don't need him. Because our life, the life of faith, we need him. We need to be people of faith. The Bible has a few references of faith. Number one, we can have no faith. No faith. The Bible says we can have little faith. Ye of little faith. Why do you have such small faith? The Bible says we have a lack of faith. Baba finally says we can have great faith. I don't want to be a church of little faith. I don't want to be a Christian of little faith. I don't want to be a Christian of lack of faith. I don't want to be a Christian of no faith. I want God to look at my life, to look at your life, to look at our lives and go, they have great faith. This morning, if you have no faith this morning, I'm praying some faith grows inside your soul this morning. If you have little faith this morning, I'm praying it grows in, the, in this service this morning. I want us to walk out of this room and go, I have faith. I'm believing. I woke up this morning looking down that scenario and I had no faith. But after church this morning, I'm believing God to do something that is bigger than me, that is beyond me. My faith is growing. I want to be a person of not blab it, grab it, not name it, claim it, not like God has to do what I say, but my faith is growing. When he, that when he tells me to sit, I sit. 
though I can't see the thing I'm hoping for, my conviction says something's there that I do not see. It's faith. Seven things that faith are. Number one, faith is you, he, he, he showed you prematurely. Um, faith is not a personality, it's a spirit. I'm sick of Christians taking biblical principles and tying them if they fit your personality or not. Like as if people are born with faith and those that aren't. Um, faith is not a personality trait, it's a spirit. So this morning you can easily look around and go, I'm not, it's, not, it's not me. You know, this whole worship thing, it's not, it's not me. I didn't know that I was born with a personality of worship. It's not really who I am. My Enneagram number doesn't really say that. My strength finders doesn't really say, no. Faith is not a personality you were born with. It's a spirit you receive. It, it, it's an attitude. It is a spirit. And you can get, especially the older, mature, more seasoned believers, and you just start talking with them, and you can feel their faith as they start to talk about God and their marriage and their finances and their journey of faith and their losses and their pain, you can feel it. Why? It's not their personality. It is a spirit they've received from God and now they become people of faith. And do not confuse it. Just because someone's loud does not mean they have faith. And I'm speaking to myself because I'm loud. Some of the most faithful people are the most quiet. Yeah, we're going to do that. You didn't yell. When, when was faith a volume? Now, I'm all in for volume because that is my personality. But faith is not a volume. Faith is on a personality. So already on, the, on the, the beginning of this sermon, do not dismiss something that you think you don't have because it doesn't fit your personality and your makeup. Well, it's not, I'm not really a faith person. I'm more of a prayer person. Prayer is not personality either. But how many disciplines that the Holy Spirit has asked us to adapt and follow into, but we say back, that's not who I am. Instead of, that's who I should become. It's not a personality. It's not just a something you're born with or something you're created into, it is a spirit, it is an attitude, it is something that you receive and that every single one of you this morning can receive that spirit. It's not how quiet you are, how loud you are, how boisterous you are, how timid you are. It does not take into account how you were raised, how you were born, who, who, who you dated, who you didn't date. All it takes into account is do you want it? Faith is not something you muster up. It is a spirit from God that you receive. I read, I read this uh, in, in a commentary this week, and I think it's noteworthy to understand. We misjudge our faith if we base its health off an emotion. We misjudge our faith if we base its health off an emotion. Faith is not an emotion that you wake up with. It's a spirit that you fall into. It's a spirit that you lead. It's a spirit that you receive. Because if you base your faith always off emotion, you will rarely have faith. You will rarely have faith. Because it's not a personality trait. It's a spirit that you can receive. It's a spirit that you can have. Um, I'll, 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 I'll wait for that. What's that in the moment? What's interesting about, interesting about this story is the Bible says, we're not getting into it today. So are we going to talk about like the whole demon possessed kid? Not today. So settle your heart. So I'm still on that story. I don't want to foam at the mouth. So let's not. What's interesting is many times in the New Testament when an evil spirit takes over someone's body, they are silenced and they cannot talk. If, if you want to nerd out on some Bible stuff, go look at how many evil spirits overtake people demon possessed, whatever you want to call it, and they cannot speak and they cannot hear. And when the Bible says that Jesus or Paul or Peter, whoever prays for these people and they get healed, they start talking. Follow me. Because the enemy always wants to silence you, but faith always gives you a voice. 
hear me today. One of, the main re, one of the main ways you can identify if you're becoming a person of faith, ask yourself, have I found my voice? Have I found my voice? It's, it's something that shifts in your heart. Like, well, I'm, I'm quiet and I'm to myself and I don't say that. I don't. No, faith is an expression. Faith is an expectation. Faith is a voice. And the enemy would like you to stay silent and not talk and lose your voice. But when you encounter Jesus and your faith is grown, one of the attributes of a growing faith is when you find your voice. It's when you find your voice in prayer. You find your voice in worship. You find your voice in expectation. You find your voice in a moment with God. Faith builds your voice. It's not a personality. It's a spirit. Number two, we, we got to go faster. Faith is not private, it's public. Faith is not private, it's public. Faith is not this private intellectual concept that you keep to yourself. It is a, faith is a public thing that takes over your entire life. Faith is not a moment, it's a lifestyle. So you don't fall in and out of faith. Right, you don't come to church and fall into the faith. Go home after brunch today and fall out of faith. Faith is not a moment. Faith is not a situation. Faith is not an experience. It's a lifestyle that we live. And every time someone is mentioned in the Bible about a life of faith, they're living a public life of faith. How many in the room, not gonna embarrass you, how many in the room are dating someone? Just real quick, you're not married, you're dating someone. Like nine people? How many wanna date someone this morning? A lot more hands. Double hands. Could you imagine if you went to your new girlfriend, say, hey, I love you. It's been two dates, but I love you. <laughs> Church stuff. Um, um, don't know her last name. You don't love her. I I'm sorry, okay? Like, <laughs> chill out. Um, hey, I know we've been on a few dates. I love you. You're my favorite. You're, I mean, you, you are, I'm, I'm all yours, okay? We're gonna get married. I'm all yours. I just don't really want to be public with you. So I, no, I love you. I love you, though. I just don't really want everyone to know, though. Some of you are like, this is my boyfriend. Break up! <laughs> now! Uh, um, <laughs> okay, side note. Some people are starting to separate. In the, um. could, could you imagine, though? If you actually treated somebody you claim to love. No, no, I'm all yours. I'm all yours. It's just, it just me and you, though. I don't want anyone else to know we're together. It's just, are you embarrassed? No, no, I love you so much, I'm going to keep you private. You would be like, this is incredibly dysfunctional. But yet we do the same thing to Jesus all the time. I love you, I'm yours, I will surrender, but just me and you, Jesus. No, no, it's never just you and Jesus. It is never a private thing. When he takes over, as we talked about last week, and you fully surrender, he goes from a private love affair to a public relationship that everyone is involved in, that everyone watches, that everyone sees. Faith is not some private, it's just me and faith. No, faith takes over and it becomes a public, I'm a person of faith. I walk in faith. I live in faith. It is not a statement. It's a lifestyle. It's not, it's not a private, hidden thing. It is a public relationship. That you have. Look at James 2. Look at James 2. We, James 2. I have too many points. This is bad news. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye, have a good day. Stay warm, eat well. <laughs> That's like hilarious. Goodbye, good day, have a, stay warm, eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead 
and useless. Hey, man, I don't really see that you're following Jesus. No, my faith is just something I believe. No, because faith is not just a spirit, it is a life. It's not just a declaration, it's a walk. It's a life. And if you're like, well, I just have a faith, it's just me and it's in my belief, and it has not taken over your life yet, James would say that faith is useless because it's only a belief, it's not a deed. And if you have faith, it actually builds into your life and changes your deeds. It changes how you act. It changes how you walk. Because faith is not an intellectual statement. It's a life that you are. Hear me, faith is not a noun, it's a verb. Faith is not a noun, something that you say that you are. It is a verb. It is actions. It is moving. It is walking. It is life. It is words. It is money. It is love. It is mercy. It is an active, moving verb. It's not a noun that you are. Faith is not private. It's public. Number three. Number three. Faith is not easy. It's a fight. Once again, I think we look at people, like I love Stephen Barb, some of my most favorite people in the entire world. Um, they've been part of our church for a while now. If you don't know them, you should get to know them. Stephen Barb. And I just look at them and go, faith's easy for them. They're just that amazing. And they're that spiritual. And you can look at people and go, oh, they just woke up that way. You have no idea the fight they had this morning. Faith is not easy. It's not an emotion. It's not that you wake up and go, I'm a faith-filled person today. Wow, I have some faith today. Many times, faith is the argument in the face of unbelief, I will believe. Faith is not denial of reality. Faith is looking at reality and declaring God's reality over your reality. Faith is not just denying what's really, no, I'm not sick. I didn't lose my car. I do have a job. Faith is not dumb. Faith is not ignorant. Faith is not a lack of, like, you're so disconnected. Brother, I am blessed. You have no job, no car. Like, you're, like, I'm, no. Faith is able to go, this is real. In the, in the face of unbelief, I have belief. In the face of unbelief. I would choose to have belief. And it's something, you must hear this today, we need some more gritty believers. We need some more scratchy, we need some more kind of uh, uh, people that have a spine to wake up in the morning. Like, you know what? I'm fighting for this. I don't feel it. I don't sense it. I don't see it. I don't even want it. I have no idea why I believe this. But I will get my spine in order and I will fight. As 2 Timothy 4, 7 says, I have fought the good fight of faith. The good fight of faith. Why do I have to fight for my faith? Because it doesn't come easy. Not to like hurt your image of the pastor this morning, but there's many Sundays I have to fight my faith here. There's many Sunday mornings, like I have nothing to say. I don't want to preach. I'm exhausted. I'm frustrated about that. We have $4 in our account. My kid won't sleep. My other kid needs Jesus. My other daughter needs a lot of Jesus. I, I don't feel like this this morning. And you would be shocked how many Sunday mornings, my little 20-minute drive here, I am fighting my faith. I'm speaking my faith. I'm fighting my faith. I'm getting my spirit in alignment. I'm getting my mind in alignment. I'm getting my heart in alignment. And I don't feel it. I don't sense it. I don't want it at many times. And I feel nothing. But I know the good fight of faith is worth my fight. And I will fight to get my faith where it should be. It's not an emotion. It's not an attitude even. Sometimes the fight of faith is when you are at the deepest valley of your life. Many of you had to fight your way here this morning. You rolled in here barely breathing. What are you doing? Fighting the faith. I am not into faking it till I make it, but I will faith it till I make it. I'm not into faking it till I make it. That's, that's anti-reality, but I will faith it till I make it. I, I will, why? Because I'm fighting the good fight. So don't even dismiss yourself. Well, it's not who I am and can't do it. And... No, we're not supposed to be passive toward faith. 
we need to fight for it. And I would say the earth needs more fighting Christians. Good fights, not bad fights. Good fights. What? The fight of faith. Number four, right? Four or five? I don't know. I'm not good at math. Four. Is this helping so far? Faith is pleasing to God, not the results of it. Faith is pleasing to God. Not if what you have faith for happens or not. Because what happens is the person dies, you lose the job, the marriage is over, the business is gone, the money's gone, the friendship is dormant. And you're, I had faith for it. I'm sorry, God, I didn't have enough faith. There is no verse in all of the Bible, even in the message version, <laughs> that says that unless your faith produces, it's not pleasing. You having faith alone is already pleasing to God. Whether what you're having faith for happens or not, comes to pass or not, produces anything or not, the result of your faith is not pleasing. The attitude and the spirit of your faith is pleasing. Many of you have had faith for things, hear me this morning, and they did not go according to plan, and you felt bad about your faith, but God was pleased by it. You're like, man, I... I prayed, I fasted, I gave, I gave the TBN lady the thousand dollars. I did it, Lord, I did it. Her wig was crooked, but I did it, Lord. It's always crooked. And I, and she died, Lord, I'm sorry. He's like, what are you sorry for? You pleased me so much. But I lost the job. No, that's not what I was pleasing for. Your confidence in me was pleasing to me. Your faith in me was pleasing to me. Your faith in my goodness was pleasing to me. Your faith in my mercy was pleasing to me. It's not what happened was pleasing. You believing in me was pleasing. Some of you is redemption this morning of a situation you've been looking back over your shoulder for, thinking you let God down and God was smiling the whole time. Man, she pleased me. But he died. That's not what pleases me. Your confidence of the assurance of what you hoped for and the conviction of things unseen, your faith was pleasing to me. Not the result of my faith. Because did you realize that though you lost the job, you gained more of God. So then maybe faith did what it was supposed to. Well, the marriage is over. Okay. I understand. My faith didn't work. What do you think the purpose of your faith was? What do you think the definition of success is? Well, that my marriage stayed. Maybe. Or was it that you would meet God in a new way? Come on. Come on. And understand him in a new way. Because you see God's goodness at the mountaintop, but you see his faithfulness in the valley. You, see, you meet God in a new way. When you think your faith didn't work. Now, your faith didn't work if you think the only reason your faith was working is if you got what you wanted. But if we would redefine definitions, friend, on what faith is, maybe you had more faith than you thought. And maybe your faith worked more than you thought. Because my faith is pleasing to God, not the results. We are people of faith. Notice. I have a lot to say. 
I want you to notice that, that I have a lot to say. Uh, <laughs> notice how the father says, I want to believe. Help me in my unbelief. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought, how could faith and the lack of faith be in relationship together? Isn't faith, the opposite of it, unbelief? What's the opposite of faith, friends? Is it unbelief? Is it fear? No, the opposite of faith is knowledge. Because what is faith? The confident in which you don't see. So if you see it, is it faith? It's getting awful quiet this morning. <laughs> the opposite of faith is not unbelief. The opposite of faith is having what you see. Is it possible to be honest about your unbelief while operating in belief? Mark 9. The man says to Jesus, I want to believe, but help me in my unbelief. Do you know in record, there's zero record in all the New Testament of the sinner's prayer? It's not even biblical. Not to burst your Christian bubble, but there is no sinner's prayer. There are two accounts of doubter's prayers. And this is one of them. I want to believe, but help me. How many of you, that's been your disposition with God? I want to believe, but help me overcome my unbelief which is simultaneously faith. Because faith is not denying I don't believe, it's the admittance I want to. He goes, I want to believe so bad, Jesus. Will you help me overcome my unbelief? <sighs> okay, it's getting quiet. Let's get even quieter. The man brings the son to the disciples. I've never seen this before. And they can't cast the spirit out. Jesus comes down from the mountain. What are you guys arguing about? And the man says, this is phenomenal, please catch this. I brought my son to you. Expecting him to get hit. Well, father, uh, you didn't bring him to Jesus, you brought him to his people. This morning I feel deeply in my spirit that God is going to restore the times that you were disappointed by his people and you thought it was him. He says, I brought you my son. No, you didn't bring you, him, you his son. You brought your son to his people. And his people let you down. And therefore, you thought God let me down. Come on. Come on. And he says, they couldn't do it. Why, Jesus? And he goes, really, guys? You faith, like, really? How many of you have walked away when other disciples let you down and you thought it was God? And my assignment from God this morning is to rebuild his, your trust in him, not necessarily his people. Even as a pastor, many times the bride could let you down and you thought it was the groom. You're like, I brought my friend, I, I brought him to the people. He's like, I wasn't there. Do you know why Christians argue? It's because it, they try to do the work of Jesus without the presence of Jesus. Jesus shows up because what are you guys arguing about? Because they were trying to do things in Jesus' name without his presence there. You ever want to ask yourself why Christians argue so much? It's because we're trying to do God things without God. And he says, I... I brought my son to you, and he goes, no, you didn't. I wasn't even here. But what he meant was, I brought my son to your people, and when I saw them, I thought of you. 
And how many of us have had our faith hurt because a fellow disciple laid us down and now we blame Jesus and he wasn't even there. This morning my assignment is to rebuild your faith in God and take back all the times that you threw on God because of what they did. Help me, I wanna believe, help me, help me, help me. I, I need help in my unbelief, but I want to believe. Number six, five, whatever, 19, whatever it is. <laughs> Faith is not an exception, it's a law. What do I mean by that? Faith does not choose its favorites, it's a law. That means I don't care how young you are, if you operate in faith, it will work for you. I don't care how old you are, if you operate in faith, it will work for you. I don't care how sinful you were in your past, if you operate in it, it's a law. I don't care how much money you have, it does not matter. I don't care how poor you are, faith does not look at people's lives and give them exceptions, it's a law. What I mean by that is it does not matter who you are, you can obey the law. When you go down 84 and it says go 55, which none of us do, <laughs> it doesn't say, but if you're rich, you can go 65. If you're poor, you got to go 30. If you're a Democrat, you have to go 80. If you're a Republican, you can go, no, it's, it's a law. No matter how nice your car is, your bumper's falling off, doesn't matter. It's a law for anyone on the highway. Faith is a law. It has no exceptions. It doesn't look at you and go, you were raised in church, I will give you faith. You did a lot in high school, you can wait. I saw you junior summer of college, no. But how, how many times we don't say that, but we look at people and go, well, of course them. Ah, oh, of course him. Look at their marriage. Come on, of course. What do you mean, of course them? As if faith has exceptions for the good people. It's a law. Which should be so encouraging to you. Because it does not matter who you are, where you come from, how much money you do or do not have, who you voted for or did not vote for, how you were raised, the parents you did or did not have, the life you lived or did not live, what you did in college or did not do in college. It does not matter. Faith is a law that if you would operate in it, it will then work in your life. See, faith honors God and God honors faith. It goes both ways. It's a law. So this morning, please don't be like, well, this is for the front row. No, it's for the person sitting in the very back of the balcony that didn't want to come today, so you're sitting up there. I'm not talking to anyone, actually. <laughs> it's you sitting here with your arms crossed like my wife came. I don't even want to be here. It's a law. I don't care who you are, what you have done or not done. If you would believe in the assurance of the things hoped for and the conviction of the things unseen, faith will operate for you just like it does for any other person. It is a law. It is always the same. It is not nitpicky. It's not exceptional. It doesn't have favorites. It is faith. It is a law. And if you would abide by the law, it would work for you just like it did for Moses, just like it did for Abraham, just like it did for Isaac, just like it did for David, just like it did for Jesus. It is a law. Number 42. <laughs> faith is not just for you, but for the community. Um, question, church? I know you're all very intelligent. You all have multiple degrees. What you say we all do? Who got healed? It's not a trick question. <laughs> The boy, the boy got healed, right? What verse did it say the boy had faith for his healing? Zero. Who had faith? The father. Whoa, whoa, whoa. in this kingdom, 
I can transfer my faith. I can move what I believe for someone, even if they don't believe for themselves. Yes, because faith is not just for you. This morning, you can be worshiping for the wife that will not come to church. Lord, I have faith in you. I'm worshiping you. I'm giving to you. I want my faith to be transferred to my uncle in Texas that does not know you and has no faith in you. I'm here on their behalf. And Jesus heals someone who doesn't even ask him to do so merely because somebody else went on their behalf. I'm here for, I'm here for him. He can't say nothing. He can't talk. He doesn't even know what's going on. He doesn't have faith. But I have faith. Look at Romans 1. Nope, that's not it. Did I give you the wrong verse? Probably. That's not it. But there's a verse in Romans 1. He says later, I can't wait to see you that I might be encouraged by your faith and you by mine. Did you know what we're doing here this morning is encouraging each other by our faith? Whether you know it or not, many of you have encouraged my faith. I've seen you step out in the business, step out in the finances, step out in the marriage, step out in your job, step out in your career, and it's building my faith. Why? Because faith is not just for you. It is for the community, and my faith should be encouraging your faith, and your faith should be encouraging her faith, and this is why gathering on a Sunday is so important. Why? So our faiths are being encouraged. Our faith is being built among each other. The life you live is not just for you. It's that others might be encouraged by your faith. And that you could actually come this morning with faith for someone else. And Jesus says, I see your faith. I'll minister to her. This morning, friend, if you, are, if, you are, if you are here in faith for your children and they're not even here, God sees your faith and he will move on your behalf. If you're here this morning worshiping for your husband that will not come to church, he sees your faith and he will work on your behalf. If you're here this morning in faith for your cousin that will not be around God or in God or do anything around God, you can have faith this morning. And God is so good. He is so great. He is so big. He is so faithful that he will see your faith faith and move it to their account. By the way, many of you are here because other people have been praying for you, staying in the gap for you. It was your grandma. It was your uncle. It was your dad. It was your sister. The reason you're here is because someone else said, Lord, I'm here for, I'm here for them. And I have faith. There is no miracle in all of the Bible that is done without faith. God does not move without faith. And this morning, you understand this, right? Where, I don't know where the band is. I'm just waiting for them to come out and kick me off stage. <laughs> Did you know that you set the tone on Sundays, not me? Not the band? It's not what list we choose. It's not even what sermon I, I preach. It's not even what text I do. It's not even the words I really say. Because faith has an expectation that you should have every single Sunday on your way to church, in the Uber, on your bike, in the car, coming up the golf cart, however you get here. I have faith for today, God. My ears are open. My eyes are open. My heart is ready. I want you to speak to me today. I have faith you're going to move today. I have faith you're going to speak to me today. I have faith people are going to be saved today. I have faith miracles are going to happen today. I have faith my life is going to turn around today. I have faith my marriage is going to get stronger today. I have faith you're going to, you're going to reach the girl I'm bringing to church today. I have faith I, you can actually show up. And it really doesn't matter what seed I cast or what seed they cast. When you come with a heart wide open, say, I have faith for today. I'm expected for today. I'm believing for the day. It really doesn't matter what happens up here. You set the tone for what happens on Sunday, not me. It's the way of faith. I don't want little faith. I don't want... No faith. I want great faith. If you're here this morning, and I don't know who 
This is for, but I want great faith. I don't know about you, but I want great faith. I want faith for my marriage. I want faith for my kids. I want faith for my finances. I want faith for the city. I want faith for businesses. I want faith for you. I want faith for your kids. I want faith for your life. I want to be known as a church. Man, if you need something, go to Rose. They have faith over there. I don't know what is over there. I don't know what's going on. But if you need your marriage fixed, go to Rose. They got a bunch of faith over there. Your marriage on the rocks, go to Rose. They got faith over there. Your kid is going through it right now, get to Rose. There is faith in the room. It's not just the, anything going on the screen, the vibe, the people, the coffee, the donuts. We are people of faith. That we expect God to move. I expect God to speak. I expect God to heal. Why? Because faith is the conviction God does not lie. And his expectation, he will do what he said. Where's your faith at this morning? Praying as we worship, your faith is being built. I heard you walked in this morning looking down the barrel of a bad scenario. Let's build our faith this morning. Not emotionalism, not control, it's faith. It's expecting God to do what he said. The Bible says this, we're gonna end, I'm done, I'm done. There are two or three are gathered, I'm there. One, two, three, okay, we're good. We have more than two people. So you know what my expectation is then? When we start singing these melodies, choruses, and bridges, God's going to be here. Do you know what my faith thinks that? Because he said it. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there. And wherever I am, there's freedom. Wherever I am, there's mercy. Wherever I am, there's miracles. Wherever I am, there's healing. Wherever I am, there's salvation. So my faith will rise today because God said, wherever two or three are gathered, I'm there. Well, guess what? We're going to sing in his name. So my faith is rising for God to move during worship because he said he would. Can you stand your feet this morning? We're going to pray. Now I want to build your faith this morning. Build your expectation. What do you need faith for today? What are you expecting today? Are you expecting, like, what was your, what was your expectation coming to church today? Well, I guess we'll go and hope it's good and hope worship doesn't suck and I hope pastor has a good word and hope they sing my favorite song. Hope that girl's there. I want to talk to her. I haven't seen her in a while. I hope she's there. I hope you see her, dude. Good luck. But what, what, what was even your reasoning of getting in the room today? Build your faith. Build your expectation in God. Father, I pray right now as we go to a time of worship. Oh God, many of us are just like that, Father. I want to believe. Help me in my unbelief. I want to believe this. I want to think this. I want to say this. I want to grab a hold of this. But help me this morning in my unbelief. I want great faith. I want to believe in what you say. I want to believe in what you do. I want to believe in who you are. I want faith. And God, as we worship you, as we exalt your name, as we sing these songs unto you, would the room be filled with faith this morning, God? We believe you this morning. Your mighty, mighty name I pray. And everyone said?